Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week we are sharing a special interview in advance of World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, July 11th, 2020. And the reason we're sharing this interview early is to help draw attention to a special screening of the film Medicating Normal, which will be shown on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. And following this special screening, there will be an online panel discussion featuring people with lived experience of taking and coming off benzodiazepines. If you haven't yet seen the film, this screening is not to be missed. The film is presented by the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, a non-profit organisation that strives to educate about the potential adverse effects of benzodiazepines taken as prescribed, and also the Periscope Foundation, which is a non-profit organisation that funded the making and continues the outreach of medicating normal. The film will be shown at 1pm EST on July 11th, and to find out more about this special screening, you can visit the WBAD website, which is w-bad.org. So, on to our interview, and I'm delighted to get the chance to chat with Angela Peacock, who appears in the film and will be a panel member for the panel discussion. Angie served in the US Army from 1998 to 2004, and was medically retired after one tour in Iraq. She was medicated for post-traumatic stress since that time, going on and off benzodiazepines several times under a doctor's care, until coming off for the final time in January 2016. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology and graduated in May 2019 from Washington University in St. Louis Brown School of Social Work with a Master's in Social Work. As a 2019 Veterans of Foreign Wars Student Veterans of America Legislative Policy Fellow, she is advocating for change in benzo policy at the Department of Veterans Affairs. She is embarking on a community outreach effort to improve medication and health literacy among military veterans and their family members. Angie chats about her experiences of being prescribed benzodiazepines, her journey off multiple medications, her continuing work in veterans advocacy, and her thoughts about the film Medicating Normal. Angie, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me for the Madden America podcast. And um, we're going to go on to talk a bit about the film Medicating Normal, which you're part of and which will be shown on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. But before we get to that, I'd like to ask a bit about you, if that's okay. So can you tell us a little bit about you and your background and how it was you came to be prescribed benzodiazepines in the first place? Well, um, my story starts when I was in the U.S. Army for about seven years, and I did one tour in Iraq, and I got extremely sick while I was in Iraq. Um, I went from 140 pounds to 100 pounds, and you could see all my bones, And I had like fainting spells and low grade fevers and fast heart rate, just something was happening. But I continued to work like that. I was doing like two to three convoys a week. Um, So then you had to worry about like getting killed by enemy fire. And just that combination of feeling like I was dying from some physical disease and the stress of, you know, combat at the beginning of the war in Iraq. Um, I, I was medically evacuated out of Iraq to back to Germany. And then the day after I got home, um, our convoy got hit. So then there was more trauma with my soldier coming back. There was trauma, you know, from um, riding on an airplane with a lot of really sick and injured people. I saw lots of mangled things, you know. So uh, after my soldier told me the story, I walked down the hallway. I just knew that I needed help. Like it was the capacity for me to be able to cope with what I had just witnessed and dealt with was just overwhelming. And I just could not contain it. I don't know how else to explain it. So I walked down the uh, hallway and I saw the sign for psychiatry and I walked in the office and I said, I need help. And that led to my very first prescription of a benzodiazepine. The name of it was clonazepam at the time, clonopin or clonazepam. And that, I feel like that decision uh, took my life off its course into a polypharmacy nightmare, which lasted 13 years. So I was prescribed over 40 psychiatric drugs in a 13 year period, mostly by the VA, but some were civilian, um, civilian providers. But 
all of those years, I sought treatment. You know, I sought therapists. I went to social workers. I went to psychologists. I went to retreats, programs, equine therapy, service dog. I mean, I tried everything just to feel better. And not once did someone say it could be the medication that you're taking. And when you were first prescribed to, were you told much about adverse effects or risk of dependence? And if not, did that lead you to want to make sure that others weren't treated the same way? No. And uh, I, I should a- answer the last part of your question about like, how did I become active in like benzo, the benzo world? And part of that was research. And I read things that said veterans with PTSD are 2.5 times more likely to die by suicide with just an exposure of a benzodiazepine. So I should not have been exposed to them in the first place, which, you know, but years later, you you read all this stuff and you find out. So no, my first appointment, that was never discussed. There was no, it was literally like a 10 minute thing where I just said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm ha- I remember the exact words I use is I'm having a hard time readjusting to Germany, which I should have been. That's normal. Like you just came out of a war zone. You're dropped off at a hospital and you're scared because you don't know what's wrong with you. Of course, you're going to have a hard time adjusting to Germany, you know, from Iraq to Germany overnight. And did you get any benefit at all from the benzos in those early days? No, I just, I remember um, very quickly, like I had these problems. I had low grade fevers. I had gastrointestinal problems. I had headaches, you know, low, um, high heart rate. But then like within two weeks I had, I couldn't sleep. Um, I heard, every time I heard a noise, I would jump. Um, I remember being scared of standing outside. I was agoraphobic. So all these new problems started but they kept saying that's the post-traumatic stress disorder. No one said like you could be having a paradoxical reaction. So I'm sure that I had some remnants of, you know, trauma that would appear to be post-traumatic stress, but like how much was it, was it a reaction to the drug? I'll never know. That's so common, isn't it? For the prescriber to reject any suggestion that the drugs are the problem while not listening to the person in front of them, who is the expert in what they're experiencing. I think in 2006, I was prescribed 18 at the same time. And I didn't, what's sad about this is when you're prescribed that many, you lose the ability to even know that there's something wrong with that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even know this is wrong. I had, that was, it was missing. But I went to a a doctor at the VA and it was kind of like my last hope. Like I had already made up my mind. I'm probably going to jump off the highest building in St. Louis. And I had already like researched which one it was going to be. And I went to that doctor and he said, I'm a psychiatrist who doesn't believe in psychiatry. You need to come off all these meds. This is way too many. And then he took me off of from 18 to 10, like overnight. And I had withdrawal symptoms in the hospital and he kept me in the hospital for like 30 days. But um, after that, it was like, I was still seeking out like what can make me feel better, but I wasn't quite sure it was the meds. Like I really thought it was this, all this trauma that I had went through So it was just a slow, slow, slow unraveling over the years where I remember so clearly in 2005, I went to a new therapist. He gave me a test in the office. I just met him. He's asking me all these anxiety questions. And okay, I have a degree in in psychology, an undergraduate degree. So I know what like this test is and I know what you're trying to do. And I just got really angry by that. Like, you're not talking to me like a human being. You're giving me a test. And then when I filled in the little bubbles, he looks at it and then he looks in his DSM and he hands it to me and he says, okay, well now you have generalized anxiety disorder. And it was at that moment, I was just like, I've done everything you told me to do. I've gone to all the doctors you told me to go to. I've taken all the pills. And now you're like giving me another diagnosis for what? I don't understand. What is this? And I was just so jaded by that point. I just was like over it. And that was when maybe a month later, I started getting extremely suicidal again during my taper, but I didn't know about the Ashton manual. I didn't know about the groups. I was just tapering the benzo. It was my last drug to get off under doctor supervision. And um, I became extremely suicidal. And not once did they say, this is from your taper. So I went into the hospital and it was when they greeted me with a wheelchair, a plastic wheelchair and two police officers. I was like, I'm here voluntarily. I'm here. I had to almost beg to let them admit me. And it was just like, I don't, it was, that whole year was just like, I can't believe this. Like, this is what I get when I ask for help. Like, I don't, it was just, that was it. So for me, I've lost all faith in the mental health care system after that. So Angie, how did you approach getting off all those drugs? And was there a key moment when you realized that you had to get off to reclaim your life? 
Well, so over those years, I tapered everything off. I saved a benzo for last. When I came off the benzo, it was extremely like a horrific withdrawal that I would not wish on my worst enemy. That was way worse than any other drug I ever came off of. And last, and still, i still have effects four and a half years later. But, um, so those first two years was like, I barely left my house. I, I tried to stay in school and took like as minimum amount of classes as I could just to keep me in reality because I felt like I was in extreme States like constantly. But, um, those first two years were the hardest. And then it was like, I, I want to want to get outside and I want to talk to other people and I want to re-engage with life again. But then I, it's almost like a reawakening that I don't even know who I am anymore. Who now that all the chemicals are erased, but I have these lasting neurological deficits. Like, what do I like? What, what do I want to do with my life? Um, who am I? outside of psychiatry because I mean I was told for years I would never finish school I would never have children I would be on meds for the rest of my life there's all these messages subtle or explicit that I took I internalized and so now at like four and a half years off it's still like I feel like I lack confidence like I'm not I still can't work so then there's that like who am I if I can't work and I'm still disabled but I don't want to go to the psychiatrist all the time you know I don't it's just like this whole reprogramming that you have to do. And then when I look at my trauma from the original trauma, that's like minimal now compared to the medical trauma that I experienced. So it's now, now it's like I'm trying to heal from the medical trauma, but who do you heal from medical trauma when the medical people don't even want to talk about it? So my, the only healing that I've found is through advocacy, through medicating normal, through benzodiazepine information coalition, through anything I can do to raise awareness about this problem, to help other people. That's where my healing has come from. Angie, I think you've done so incredibly well to get your life back after that experience. And to go on to help and support others just shows your courage and determination. You're a board member, I believe, of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, and you've lobbied for changes to the policies that guide how the Department of Veterans use benzos. So can you talk us through what you'd like to change in benzo prescribing? I I think in the year 2019, they gave out 8 million prescriptions, 30-day prescriptions, which is, to me, astronomical. And we don't know if that's 30 days and that's it for like a novel prescription or if that's a continuation of someone that's given 30-day prescriptions for years. Um, The way that they track benzodiazepine prescriptions is minimal at best. Um, But they also have, I found an interesting inspector general report while I was doing this research that showed a veteran who'd been on it for like 20 years and then his doctor decided he shouldn't be taking anymore. And they showed a chart that as he tapered, his suicide attempts went up and he ultimately died by suicide. And it was directly tied to the, the way that they, he was deprescribed. And the suggestion or recommendation from the inspector general was veterans that are on long-term benzos should be left alone. Like, which is hard for me to even, you know, say that these drugs are so harmful, but when you take them away, that can also be equally harmful, especially when you take them away abruptly. So um, I think it, the VA needs a complete overhaul with the way that Doctors are taught about deprescribing with how they're taught about prescribing them in the first place with them knowing the evidence that it puts us at greater risk of suicide, greater risk of dementia, greater risk of falls, so many other effects, you know, um, especially among my generation of Iraq and Afghanistan vets who have traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder. We have exposure to burn pits. There's just so many things coming together that adding a benzodiazepine to the mix is just not good for any of us. So we need pharmacy to be aware. We need tapering schedules that are patient-centered, um, education about withdrawal symptoms, support for withdrawal. I mean, there was support that I could have used that I couldn't get. No one believed me what I was going through. I had doctors tell me that I had MS, that I had a microscopic brain injury, that none of this was really happening. You know, the gaslighting that, you know, the trauma from that. But, um, I, the VA needs a complete overhaul with benzos. And I think they, they made an attempt to try. There is web pages that show they are trying in the tapering. It looks like they took a little bit from Malcolm Ladder and a little bit from Heather Ashton, but then they like shortened it in half. So the evidence that they're using, I don't know who's coming up with this guidance, but it's not 
evidence-based, which they claim to want to use evidence-based medicine. So um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's disheartening to me because every time I hear a suicide in the veterans community, I want to know what was he taking, you know, or what was she taking? What is going on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I also read that you kind of support and advocate for um, veterans. And, and you mentioned you, you have a master's in, in social work. So, you know, what kind of help and support do you provide to people? And I know myself that the best advice I've ever got is from people that have been there, you know, never from a prescriber who only has a in theory understanding of, of what's happening for people. Yeah, well, when while I was going through this, I went back to school to try to in my head, I thought, I want to work in the system to help change the system from inside. But while I was, and, and it's probably because I'm so close to this happening to me that um, I found school very traumatizing. Like the way that they talk about patients, the way they talk about people with mental health problems. Uh, and I would sit there always and be like, you're talking about me. Like the way that you are talking. It's like, it's like when your parents are talking about you and you're in the other room and you overhear them. That was the feeling I constantly had. And any pushback that I ever gave, even saying simple things like antidepressants cause withdrawal, it was always like, no, we don't need to talk about that right now. So it's like the whole system is complicit and I don't want anything to do with that. Um, and I did a year and a half, well, almost well, like 14 months. I did 14 months of um, th- giving therapy to people without diagnosing them, without referring them to psychiatry, without calling people when they were suicidal. And I enjoyed that, but I thought I need to reach more than just one person at a time. So for now, I do what I can. I, I'm involved in several nonprofits with the veteran world. So sometimes they'll call me and say, like, well, what do you think about this? You know, I did a fellowship with veterans of foreign wars and talked about the prescribing and deprescribing of benzodiazepines at the VA level. Um, I help with peer support group with Wounded Warrior Project. I just I talk to lots of veterans. I run a group uh, for St. Louis veterans. I don't know. I just do what I can where I can. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important, isn't it? Because vet- veterans are so vulnerable to when when suffering from you know stress and trauma. So vulnerable to being prescribed to and and misadvised and ill-advised. That kind of brings me nicely onto the film Medicating Normal, which you know I, I watched. And the first thing to say is you know it's immensely powerful. You know it really made me very angry watching it because you know the, the way that we treat people and the way that it's explained that we take someone's grief or trauma and we turn that into a medical illness and we label them and the label only leads in one direction and that's drugs and more drugs and you know it was an incredibly powerful watch but you know I I wondered Angie how you how you came to be involved in that film I didn't find the support groups the online community until I was four months of off of everything and I guess there was an ad or something they ran an ad and I saw the ad and I was like I'm not doing that you know (laughs) and then someone I guess one of the producers told me that they had asked someone on Facebook, you know, we really like your story. Would you tell it to us? And the, the lady said, no, but you should talk to Angie Peacock. She's a warrior or something. So basically the producer messaged me and I, she said, we were doing a film. Would you like to be in the film? I was like, no. And then she said, well, can I call you? And so she called me and I told her like this much of my story. And then she said, well, I want to, and I said, no again. And she said, well, I want to fly out there and talk to you in person. Do you mind if I fly out? And I was like, okay, but I'm not, doing it, you know? So she flies out. I said, I tell her again, I don't want to do it. But then by the end of the conversation, we had taken a walk and I told her a little bit more of my story. And then she basically said like, you have to do this. You, I mean, you're, you could speak to the veteran angle and I was in documentaries before this. So there was like this other footage out there of when I was really ill and taking a lot of meds. So in a roundabout kind of way, when she left the car and I closed the door, I thought to myself, well, now I can't kill myself because there's this film. And like, if I'm going to be a part of it, like you don't want them to say like you died at the end. you know. So in this roundabout way, it kind of saved my life because they, they would come back every few months to see progress. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm a part of it. I really am. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I am too, you know, the, the, I think, as I mentioned to you, I was so pleased to see lived their personal experience really front and center in that film because, yeah, the expert views are great, but it's the people that have been through this that are the biggest source of, you know, the caution that we we should all have about how freely we're prescribing these drugs. And, you know, I was really struck, Angie, too, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying, you know, you, you kind of you relived the the trauma of losing a comrade and you know in 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 you know in your troop and on the film you kind of see you experience that and you know you think 
was this kind of muted and blunted by the drugs for so many years and you still had to go through that process of grieving and, it, and it's kind of captured in the documentary it really i really felt for you i really did oh, thank you so much yeah it was definitely like a, i feel i felt really robbed that i could have grieved a lot of this trauma earlier and that even all i did all those all the therapy that i did when you're on medications i don't think you fully get to really repair like repair those things or like you can't fully I don't even know how to explain it you just can't you can't fully feel what happened to you and you can't integrate it so now that I'm off it's like there's a systematic way that I have to go through things to like repair those feelings that I should have had 15 years ago but I'm just now getting to do that so in a way I feel robbed of my own healing process yeah I understand and you know obviously you know, the film has been screened a number of times now and, and it's going to be shown on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day itself. So, you know, I just wondered what reaction you've had from others about, you know, your role in the film and, and the film overall. Well, it, this is a cool story. Um, when I graduated from social work school, my lease was up. So I sold everything and jumped in an RV and drove off into the sunrise and started screening it across the United States. So I've done, we've done about 75 screenings. I've done 40 or so by myself on the road through Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, um, North Carolina, all over the place. So I've met maybe 3000 people in person and um, the reaction has been almost 99% positive. And there's always that one person, you know, <laughs> that you remember, but a lot of people, I mean, it's just undeniable when you see the experience, the lived experience of five people, and then you hear the experts saying it, there's like not, there's very little that people can say to refute that. And with, and if you were to refute that, you're refuting someone's personal lived experience. So I, I think they just did a beautiful job. I mean, I've seen people go from knowing zero to like understanding the things that you talk about in Madden America within 76 minutes, you know, but the best part for me is the discussion after the film, which you'll see on world Benzo day, Benzo awareness day is that it's a chance for the community to talk back and say like, this is what changed me. This is what moved me. This is what I learned. And I mean, I've just seen people have like revelations about their life. Like, Oh my God, this explains why my daughter is can't heal right now. Or this explains my, my marriage was my ex-husband and why we broke up. It was, he was taking all these meds and I didn't understand before. Now I understand. So there's just this education level and awareness. And I, I, I think it changes every person that sees it. And that's the, the way that I prefer to do advocacy now is that instead of this huge systems change or me being in the mental health care system, it's like one patient at a time, one person at a time, uh, hopefully to prevent it and, you know, prevent further harm if possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think my reflection on the film is, you know, having lived it myself, of course, it spoke to me and validated a lot of what I've been through. But I think it's so important also for family members who, you know, close family who are with you, they get it because they've seen the misery that you've been through. But extended family, you know, might be in the, the circle of thinking, oh, well, you know, the drugs can't be that bad. Surely this is all part of the illness or part of the diagnosis or whatever. But I think the film does a brilliant job of dispelling all that and showing real people suffering real things and having, you know, an inappropriate response to those experiences made. So I think for family members, it's crucial viewing too. Yes, me too and parents and prescribers. I've even had prescribers in the audience say, oh my God, I didn't know. I've had prescribers cry and say, how can I give informed consent if I'm not even giving informed consent? You know, a lot of times we want to blame the doctors, but they're a victim of this too in a different way. And so, uh, you know, Angie, given your experiences yourself and, you know, through the film and, and through advocating for others, you know, if, if there are people listening to this who are having a tough time of it, either taking benzos or, or, or trying to get off them. Are there any kind of general words of support and encouragement that you kind of give to people to, you know, help them come to terms with understanding what's happening to them? Yeah, I think read as much as you can. Talk to people that have been through it. Um, it's okay to look for support, to rule out any other illness, you know, rule out any other medical causes that could be causing the way you feel. But um to just really simply take it one day at a time. Sometimes it's one minute at a time, one breath at a time. Uh, live absolutely in the day if you possibly can getting through this. It's extremely hard for many, many, many people. And there's not little support. It's very, 
stigmatizing, isolating experience. So hang on tight to your healing buddies, find a healing buddy that you can relate to and um, just wait for time to pass because healing is definitely real. I mean, if I can heal from more than 40 psychiatric drugs in a 13 year period, and I've had a few brain injuries on top of it, um, I'm here to say that you're going to heal too. Yeah, that's fantastic. That that encouragement so important for people, isn't it? Because it's um, it's the long haul, isn't it? Again, you know, healing from from these things, and and so um, you know, as we said, the film's going to be shown on well benzodiazepine awareness day itself. And you know, I was delighted to hear, as you mentioned, that you're part of a kind of post screening panel along with uh, Nicole and uh, you know some recognised experts too. So you know, you've obviously experienced those kind of panels before. So what what are they like? What kind of things happen at those panels generally? Well, the, I think the best part is just hearing from the audience, but also when we add different uh, perspectives to the panel, it's a chance to unwind some of the complex issues raised in the film because we talk I mean there's there's topics in the film like informed consent you know side effects withdrawal the evidence base for the mental health system so when we bring other experts on the panel they can kind of unwind those complex issues that we didn't get to in the film so it's it's just it's a really unique opportunity I don't think these conversations are taking place anywhere else where the power structure of prescriber and patient is leveled after watching the film so I mean, there's people that are currently taking meds that are off, the doctors in the audience, board members from BIC, you know, um, teachers, therapists, everybody in the same room having the same conversation after watching the same film. So please come. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I can genuinely say that, you know, if, if I'd have had a chance to see that film and experience it around the time that I was first prescribed to, I, I'd be in a very different place in my life now. And, you know, I, I thank you and all the people involved in the film because it's crucial watching for, for people to validate their own experiences, for prescribers to think, well, hang on, I didn't realize, you know, all, all this was going on. And for your work with VA policy as well in terms of what's the first line of response to somebody coming in and saying, I'm having a, a difficult time with trauma and, and all these other things. So, you know, I think the, the film speaks really powerfully about that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we it's it's been great to be involved with it. Great. Well, Angie, you know, I, I just remains to say thank you so much for making time for this and for everything you've done with the film. And you know, I know people listening will get a huge amount from it. And you know, I hope a, a whole pile of people actually watch the film itself on the eleventh and then watch the panel discussion as well afterwards. And I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Well, I just want to say a huge thank you to Angie for taking the time to chat. And I highly recommend that you see the film Medicating Normal if you can. It's a powerful and deeply affecting account of the many risks of unsafe prescribing practices and the perils of applying psychiatric drugs to grief, stress and trauma. I want to thank all those who took part in the film and all those who made it happen and continue to work to screen the film and to discuss its implications. So that's it for today, but look out for another podcast which we'll be sharing on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day itself. As always, thank you so much for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.